my dears, how's it going? Happy July? Uh, that's the month that it is, and I'm definitely filming this in July. Um, in case you're not aware for some reason, the Olympics starts uh, in a few weeks, followed by the Paralympics. And last Olympics, two years ago, I made a video about the history and potential issues with the Paralympics. And in that video, I briefly mentioned the discussion around trans inclusion in sporting events. So I decided why not talk about that for this Olympics, because we're all about thinking critically and actually reading research on this channel. Um, also, you should definitely go watch the video about the Paralympics. I will link it up here and at the top of my description because I rewatched it while researching this and I genuinely learned a lot. So go off, baby Sydney. I really appreciate you. Um, and on the topic of videos that you should watch, also, um, a lot of the preliminary research and organization for this video came from Mia Mulder's video essay, uh, Should Trans Women Be Allowed in Women's Sports from two years ago? And you should definitely go watch that video after this one. Other housekeeping things. For friends who need it, I'm a white person with light brown shoulder length curly hair. I am wearing a uh, blue and white striped jumpsuit. You can just see the straps of it. Um, and I'm sitting in front of a blank wall that has green leaves on it. Also friendly reminder that my pronouns are they them and hey, don't be a transphobe. Um, I will be monitoring comments to the best of my ability, but I also only log into YouTube like twice a month um, because I upload in chunks. So either way, uh, please be kind to one another in the comment section and remember that it is okay to be wrong. Um, it is okay to change your mind on something when you gain new information. And if something makes you uncomfortable or angry, that doesn't mean that that feeling is incorrect, but it also means that maybe you should sit with that feeling for a hot minute and ask yourself why you might feel uncomfortable or angry because it might be a societal reason rather than a realistic reason. Cool? Great. Amazing. So begin with, why is sport. And the first reason is play. Most animals use play as a way to aid in development. Play is by definition muck around and find out, and that gives you a lot of quick information as to what works, what doesn't work, how to interact with others if that's a thing that your species does, and it lets you hone your skills to be fundamentally better at survival. And also because it's fun and a good way to get out extra energy, and we all know that babies have a lot of the wiggles. The other thing is that organized play with other people, like sports, gives somebody the ability to assess the skills of others. So sports makes for really great military fitness tests to see what soldiers are good at what things, what people are best fit as soldiers and are also another way to practice and hone skills that they may use when they join the military. Now because it is sometimes hard to distinguish Greek myth from Greek history, we're not entirely sure why the original Olympic Games started, but it's generally understood as being a religious festival to honor Zeus, where people from all over ancient Greece would come to Athens to compete. They were never the perfectly peaceful let's all hold hands together and have fun playing games. They were they were political even from the very beginning. Um, but in the mid-1800s, with the Industrial Revolution going on, people in Europe and later the US were suddenly finding themselves with a lot of free time to spend on whatever they wanted, and this led to the revival of the Olympic Games in 1859. Now, since women did not participate in the Games until 1900, and they didn't have any other professional competitions until the late 1800s, men had the advantage. They had more tournaments to play in, and more people to play against to improve their skill set, and also all the sports science, funding, and sport technology and equipment was based on men. So to make sure that everybody had the same disadvantage, to make playing fair, they separated men's sports and women's sports. And there was probably a little bit of like man strong, woman weak motivation in there as well. But the gender division primarily existed because women were factually at a disadvantage because they simply had less resources. And also were often playing in skirts, but that's a different conversation. The main point is the division of leagues was semi-arbitrary based on overall understanding of fairness, mixed in with the socio-political understandings of gender and womanhood at the time. Put a pin in that. Now, gender differences in sports are quite complicated. There are some sports where there's no difference between how men compete and how women compete. There are sports that have differences because of physical differences and beauty standards, like the uh, more artistic sports where they're looking for like specific physical lines and whatever that can be gender specific. There are sports that have differences simply because traditionally men learn it one way and women learn it another way. Um, also often in the more artsy sports and also because the history of sexism can make sports different because of the history of sexism. Like there's a women's division in chess because of the history of sexism and lack of inclusion of women from the beginning, not because there's any actual inherent gender difference in how women play chess versus how men play chess. And before you say that male brains and female brains are fundamentally different, there's no conclusive evidence as to that being a fact other than yes. Men and women have different societal expectations as to what kinds of things they'll pay attention to, but when given neutral tests, there is virtually no difference in ability to perform, and generally there is more statistical difference and overlap between different brains within each gender category than between separate genders. Also, brains are plastic, so when given the same number of opportunities to learn a specific skill, they can easily reach the same level. I have a video about so-called gendered brains up here if you want that research deep dive. Also, in many sports, the women's leagues are now at a level identical to men because they've been catching up, so the original disadvantage is no longer present in some sports. And this is where we need to pause for a hot second and talk about the concept of gender and sex, because in the conversation of trans people in sports, these two things often get used interchangeably when they're not interchangeable concepts. To put it as simply as possible, 
Gender is how a person identifies. They may identify as a woman or a man or a non-binary person or an agender person or a demi-boy or a demi-girl or anything else. And that gender may align with the sex they were assigned at birth, like they might have been assigned female at birth and identify as a woman for their whole life, or they might have been assigned female at birth and identify as a man or a non-binary person. And sex is more complicated because there are lots of different things that determine somebody's sex. Their chromosomes, what's in their pants, what secondary sex characteristics they have, etc. And gender and sex as two separate concepts was not really understood as a thing until the 1950s, which is why people often mix it up so often because it's still fairly new to the lexicon. But when it comes to gendered sports, as we're about to see, the question of whether it's sexed or gendered is one that various sporting organizations honestly aren't quite sure about. And looking at sex in sports, there are factually some biological differences, but stick with me here. We know, for example, that the average male has different levels of different hormones in comparison to the average female. We also don't quite know how much a specific level of each specific hormone actually affects how they perform in a sport because giving somebody an extra boost of a specific hormone is not the equivalent of somebody living at their own body's equilibrium, and also there are so many other confounding variables that it cannot be objectively tested. We also know that the biological differences within a group of females or within a group of males is larger than the average biological differences between males and females. And sure, a trans woman might seem to have a small advantage if she had gone through male puberty, which made her lightly taller and stronger than she might have been had she gone through female puberty initially, but also, if we met a cis woman who was six foot two and could deadlift 200 pounds, and those people very much exist, I'm friends with several of them, we would go, oh, you're built for basketball or other sports where you need to be tall and strong. We don't question whether it's ethical that they play that sport when they're built that way. We only question it when it comes to trans people. We also know that trans women do not maintain any physical advantages that they may have had after two years on hormones, though they do seem to maintain about a 12% advantage in running, but also there are so very few scientifically sound studies actually trying to get firm numbers on advantages or disadvantages, and the majority of them come up with completely different results. So those two things are mostly empirically understood in that there's like maybe three studies that agree on it, but beyond that it's just kind of a foggy mess and we don't know what's going on. And there's this fear, right, that trans women are going to take over sports and they're going to win everything and it's not fair to the women and also that this is a new problem. Um, but did you know that the International Olympic Committee, which will be called the IOC henceforth in this video, has had a policy about fair competition involving trans people since 2003, and we didn't have our first trans Olympian until 2020, and also she didn't win any medals. And about 1% of the population is trans, and in 2020 there were 11,420 Olympians, which means that there should have been 114 trans Olympians to accurately represent our prevalence in humanity in those games. And as far as I can tell, there were three, two of which were non-binary and competing in the division of their gender assigned at birth. So in reality, trans people are actually vastly underrepresented in sports. Meanwhile, the oh, there's men pretending to be women in women's sports, we must do everything we can to protect the women fears have been around forever. In 1966, Life magazine ran an article about how that year's European championships had begun enforcing sex testing because of concerns that some of the top female athletes were not actually women. And sex testing at the time involved very invasive physical exams done in front of a panel of doctors. Also, the article uses proof of a person who competed in the games as a woman and then later transitioned as a man and stopped competing as like proof? I guess, when that's not what the issue was to begin with. And also, it talked about how some of the Soviet competitors didn't show up for their testing, saying that they were injured and they didn't compete, so that means they must have been men in disguise, which just so clearly reads as anti-Soviet propaganda. Obviously, that would have read differently in 1966, but it was it was very obvious. Now, a Polish runner by the name of Eva Kobukowska, who had won bronze at the 1964 Olympic Games running 100 meters, passed this exam in 1966. Then, in 1967, they decided to do chromosomal testing instead, and she failed this test and was barred from competing in all professional sports and had her three world records erased. Now the thing with chromosomes is that we all learned in high school biology that females have XX chromosomes and males have XY chromosomes, which is the average typical situation, but there are also people with XXY chromosomes or just an X chromosome. Some women are born with XY chromosomes but have complete androgen sensitivity syndrome and thus they develop a female phenotype. There are also other ones that I'm not thinking about right now. And these are known as DSDs, which are disorders or differences of a sex development. And these are also obviously things that most people don't know about until they're being tested for them. If we did chromosomal testing for everybody in the population, we would find that a lot of people actually have different chromosomes than they think that they do. In 1999, the IOC decided to get rid of compulsory gender verification, though they do still reserve the right to request verification from any individual at any time if they feel that the need arises. This is still the case. In 2003, as we talked about earlier, the first guidelines on trans women participating in the Olympics were created by the IOC, and these preliminary requirements were that they had to be legally recognized as their gender identity 
identity. They need to have been on hormones long enough to remove any potential advantage, and they need to have completed all of the sex change surgeries. And no trans people competed at the Olympic level under these guidelines, though in 2015, a trans cyclist named Kristen Worley did sue, saying that she shouldn't have to go through surgery she did not plan to do in order to compete because that's medically unnecessary and what's in her pants does not impact how she competes. She won this ruling in 2017, but in 2015, it did lead to the change in gender policy that removed all restrictions from trans men competing in men's sports and removed sex reassignment surgery as a requirement, focusing almost exclusively on hormone regulation guidelines for trans women. This is in line with the 2011 change to their rules on sex testing, which was enforcing a testosterone limit on all female competitors. The limit was 10 nanomoles per liter, which is on the lower end of the typical male levels for testosterone. An Indian sprinter by the name of Duti Chand was banned from competing for her high testosterone levels, and she appealed this ban, citing that the International Association of Athletic Federations, henceforth in this video called the IAAF, which recently changed its name to World Athletics, but I refuse to call it that, um, didn't have enough scientific evidence that links high testosterone to female athletic performance. And the court agreed with her, and they lifted the ban temporarily. Another famous case is Castor Semenya, a South African runner who won two Olympic gold medals and three world championships. She ran so well at the 2009 world championship that people started to suggest that maybe she was a man in disguise, and so she was put through sex testing. As far as I can tell, she has never personally shared her medical information, um, but lots of sources claim to know precisely what condition or condition she has. I've seen four different things mentioned. Also, at the end of the day, we're not entitled to her medical information anyway, um, so we're not going to get into that. But either way, she's very much a cis woman. She was uh, assigned female at birth, and she identifies as a woman, so she is a cis woman. And up until 2018, she was allowed to compete because of Duty Chan's appeal. But in 2018, new regulations showed up that dropped the previous testosterone limit of 10 nanomoles per liter that they then got rid of. They brought it back and they dropped it to five nanomoles per liter based on new data. Data that were commissioned by the IAAF and whose scientific validity has been heavily questioned by the scientific community, which we'll get to in a moment. This new testosterone limit only applied to track distances between 400 and 1500 meters, the events that Semenya did, and not the events that Chand did. So Chand was able to compete with her testosterone levels, but Semenya was not. Well, Semenya would have been if she had uh, got on medication to lower her testosterone levels, but obviously that would have had serious side effects. And a lot of people went, um, I feel like these regulations are weirdly targeted. First of all, because many women with PCOS hit the five nanomol testosterone level naturally, and PCOS is significantly more common in female Olympians than it is in the general population. So why these regulations are specific to her very small handful of events that's very odd. But also, because if you look at all the research not funded by the IAAF or any other athletic federations on testosterone and athletic performance, well, yes, taking a testosterone supplement to add to your natural level is going to create some changes. The data around natural testosterone levels is absolutely all over the place. Some studies found negative correlations, some found positive correlations, and most others found no correlation at all. Some of the best athletes in any given sport will have testosterone levels all over the map, and you cannot predict how well they're going to perform based on the levels of testosterone in their body. It's also important to note that many women with atypically high testosterone levels may have that because they have weak or no androgen receptors to actually make use of said testosterone. Like, their bodies may produce more of it because it has a harder time using it, and so it needs to have more in its system. And it also seems like cis men are more sensitive to the effects of testosterone in their bodies than cis women are. Sometimes. So to force a person to go on a high dose of a medication that they don't need to lower levels of a thing in their blood that's probably that high for a reason is just completely unethical. Also based on like what research, right? Like it's the research is just really inconclusive. And both the UN and the World Medical Association have stated that it is unethical to force a uh, competitor to do uh, unnecessary medical treatment for the sake of competing. And also, putting physiological health aside, we also know that sex testing like this has serious impacts on mental health, with many cases of women who have discovered that they are intersex through this testing, questioning their gender identity and contemplating suicide. And also, often these tests are done without their knowledge or consent. But going back to the this feels weirdly targeted aspect of it all, it is weirdly targeted, mainly because sex testing is only done in athletes who are deemed suspicious. And the athletes deemed suspicious are usually the black and brown athletes because people view them as not fitting the traditional, read, white, female beauty standards. And so there's a fairly high chance that everybody running a race might have elevated testosterone levels, but only the black and brown runners who win will be questioned about why they may have won, suggested to be cheating, and then tested and thrown out of the competition. Not only did this ruling mean that Semenya could no longer compete, but it also impacted the other two athletes who were on the podium with her in Rio, who are from Burundi and Kenya. The three of them were the only black women in the finals for the women's 800 meter. And bringing sexism back into the mix, we're defining sex by an increasingly over-medicalized complicated checklist of things that's meant to 
exclude trans women without saying that's what we're doing, which is then dividing up what cis women are allowed to actually count as women, also a very racialized divide, and we're punishing women for being different from one another because the IOC thinks it's important to be a little bit discriminatory in order to preserve the integrity of female sport. When at the same time, Tons of advertisements of think pieces and whatnot are published about how cool it is that Michael Phelps has a genetic advantage because he has an atypically wide wingspan, he has a lung capacity twice that of the average person, and his body produces less lactic acid than the average person. Or the other guy, I don't remember what his name was, um, but he's like a snowboarder or a skier or something like that, and he's like a red blood cell disorder or something that makes his body hold on to significantly more oxygen than other people do, and he's praised for his natural doping, which really further puts into perspective how this paternalistic, oh, we need to aggressively define what makes somebody a woman to ensure fairness for the women, is completely absurd and based in misogyny, racism, and paternalism. Sports are not fair. They never will be. That's what makes them interesting. And it means people learn different ways of doing the same task for their bodies, and then all of these diverse people compete against each other, and we get to see how their different strengths and weaknesses play into their sport. If we tried to make the playing field perfectly fair, that would be boring because everybody would be exactly the same. It would also be eugenics, which is bad. Um, and also, if we keep dividing people into subgroups, there's nobody to play against and all sports fall apart anyway. But let's also put a pin in that and go back to our little timeline. Now in 2021, three years after the 2018 ruling, the IOC changed their guidelines again to say that they would not force athletes to undergo any medically unnecessary procedures or treatments. This new policy centers the physical and mental well-being as well as the privacy of everybody and says that no athlete should be precluded from competing or excluded from competition on the exclusive ground of an unverified, alleged, or perceived unfair competitive advantage due to their sex variations, physical appearance, and or transgender status. It also specifically supports trans competitors, though it doesn't really handle what to do about non-binary people, it leaves the power of precise requirements up to those in charge of each specific sport, and it also isn't legally binding, so we don't entirely know what it looks like in practice should a situation arise. But it is largely seen as a sort of win while also probably being a little bit too little too late, um, but also most commentary that I've seen on this policy was published in 2022 and I couldn't find anything updated since then since we haven't had another Olympics until a few weeks from now and the opinions and a reality of what this policy is may change in the near future. Um, but a year later, the NCAA, which is in charge of college sports in the United States, changed their rulings as well. And the original ruling was that trans people assigned female at birth can compete on either team if they're not on testosterone, they must compete on the men's team if they are on testosterone, which must be approved as treatment for dysphoria, and they must submit labs throughout the season to prove that they're at or below the average male level of testosterone. And a trans person assigned male at birth must compete on the men's team unless they've been on at least one documented year of testosterone suppressants, in which case they can compete on the women's team, however they also need to submit labs throughout the season, all of which was generally seen as cool and chill with the trans community. Then they made these 2022 changes, supposedly to update them to be similar to the new IOC guidelines, but they do not include any specific safeguards against invasive procedures, tests, or treatments, and they don't comply with the World Professional Association for Transgender Health's most recent standards of care. And also, uh, Olympic level sporting and college level athletics uh, pardon the sort of pun, two different ball games, completely different ball games, and what at an Olympic level could come down to a very minute physical difference is probably not going to at a college level. And yes, and also thank you to Skylar Baylor uh, at Pink Manta Ray on Instagram for pulling together most of the statistics I use in this video. 80% um, of Olympians were NCAA athletes, but also only 2% of NCAA athletes become Olympians. So the standards do not need to be as strict or highly medicalized for the college division, and also the new standards by the NCAA are uh, worse than the new IOC standards standards by a lot, so even that defense doesn't really work. And then, when we bring it even younger, the concern about trans children is even more absurd to me. Because first of all, uh, children of different genders have literally no significant biological differences that could impact playing sports until they're around 12 years old. But also because most kids do sports because they're fun. It's not a career. It's not winning a medal for their country. It's literally just having fun and being in community with fellow peers and getting out the wiggles in an organized way and learning, I don't know, skills around uh, coordination and around listening and around teamwork and all of that kind of stuff. And yes, winning matters. Absolutely. But again, things coming down to a very minute physical difference like we might see in the Olympics is not a thing that's going to really be an issue in grades K through 12. And regulations on trans players at this age group, particularly around sex testing, much like with Olympian women, don't just affect the trans kids, who are already some of the most marginalized and at-risk kids that we have right now. It impacts all the other girls and young women competing. Women in the Olympics have talked about how humiliating and degrading the accusations that they're men in disguise and the process of sex testing is for them, so imagine how that would feel for a teenager who is literally just trying to do an extracurricular. And also, allowing the school government or any other regulatory body the ability to do invasive exams and genetic testing on young people is very concerning and so, so, so rife for abuse. Not to mention that it continues the unnecessary policing of women's bodies and 
of demonizing trans people, and it's all just very icky to think about, and I try not to think about it too hard. Not to mention, and I didn't say this earlier, but even with Olympians, having any sort of genetic testing done can impact your health insurance rates, and you'd think that Olympians aren't hurting for money, but the stories of Paralympians being unable to pay for their health care leads me to think otherwise, so that's also not a thing to be taken super lightly. But the reason all of this has become such an issue lately is not necessarily because sports are super overwhelmingly concerned about all of this. As we said earlier, the newer regulations around this stuff aren't perfect, but they're NCAA aside, a step in the right direction. And it seems wild that I would quote a New York Times article about a trans issue given their track record, but this specific one really stood out to me. The science is still catching up to this conversation. So for now, we're navigating policies largely based on values. And that's what it comes down to. There is no one specific trait that all trans and intersex people have in common that some cis people might not also share. And as far as I can tell, that seems to be generally understood, which is why the solution is to just ban trans people and not think about it. Because at the end of the day, people aren't actually Actually super concerned about the integrity of sport. A lot of people don't really care about sports until it becomes a trans issue and now they care about sports. This is just another reason to further transphobic rhetoric to say why you don't like trans people and all of that kind of stuff. Also, as Mia Mulder said in her video, when the bathroom bills kind of died down, the transphobes needed a new issue and this is where they turned. The majority of these conversations aren't coming from sports organizations. They're coming from politicians and news outlets capitalizing on rage bait, primarily in the US and the UK. And sure, you can argue that there is a little bit more depth to the fears behind this issue than like where are trans people allowed to pee um but hopefully at this point you understand that the science is very inconclusive and again sports aren't going to be fair they never are and if you do care about fairness and the integrity of sport let's talk about how upper class athletes have a much higher advantage because they can afford to be professional athletes let's talk about how women's sports are considerably less broadcasted talked about considerably more sexualized and receive significantly less funding and pay if we want to bring paralympics into this conversation let's talk about the fact that the average to disabled person cannot afford a super expensive basketball wheelchair or running prosthetics, or that most of us can't even exercise at all because gyms don't have adaptable equipment. Um, let's talk about how it's estimated that anywhere from 14 to 39 percent of elite athletes are intentionally doping and completely getting away with it. Let's talk about racism and systemic oppression. Those are all things that have a lot more solid data behind them than the issue of a handful of people maybe having an advantage, but maybe also probably not, but we don't actually have the data to prove any of it. And I can't remember which article this came from, but I read something that talked about how making things fair and creating justice means means helping the people who are the worst off and the most stigmatized and lifting them up, which is the exact opposite of how this conversation has been handled because it primarily targets trans and intersex people of color, all supposedly to protect women. And at that point, then you're just protecting white women, which we don't need to do. I mean, we do because sexism is still a problem, but you know what I mean? We need to be, um, uplifting the more marginalized people in the women category, which is not doing. And I don't think that binary division in sport in general is super helpful. Um, there's a lot of suggested options that could be different depending on the sport, like weight class or height, which you can then move up to the next level if you outcompete your level. There could also be multiple different categories, kind of like the Paralympics has based on different traits, though also a huge critique of the Paralympics is how half of the process is medically sorting out who fits in what category and who's more or less disabled, uh, and also could potentially accidentally give away private medical information while doing so. And also, what's the point if you have so many categories that you're no longer finding who's the fastest runner or the best soccer team, but instead who's the best in this hyper specific group of this specific group of this specific thing? And it holds a lot less meaning and value. Kind of like how uh, Aaron Tveit definitely deserves a Tony Award because he's fantastic in everything that he does, but the fact that he won when he was the only nominee in his category makes it a little bit less impactful, you know? And actually, speaking of the arts, we're having similar but different conversations about gendered categories at awards here because, on one level, making the non binary pick a binary category is a problem. But on another level, there's the risk that gender neutral categories would always go to the man because of the inherent bias in this industry. But if there was a trans specific category, it would be so tiny that it would create a similar what's the point conversation. But also some of the categories are already non-gendered and they go to women all the time. So overall, that's just a super complicated conversation. But the reason that I bring this up is because in the arts, we tend to carry a little bit more nuance around how all different kinds of skills are valued and valuable. And somebody who starred in a comedy might be nominated alongside somebody who starred in a tragedy, you know? And that's more of a qualitative judgment as to who wins the Tony rather than a quantitative judgment, which a lot of sports are just quantitative. Not all of them, there's qualitative, but anyway. I will say that uh, the theater industry tends to reward performance and tragedy over performance in comedy because we see tragedy as being more difficult when comedy is usually actually more difficult. Um, so there is some bias there, but 
for the sake of argument. And yes, the politics around the Tonys are lovingly kind of a disaster, but they're also a sort of celebration of the craft as a whole. And the general vibe that I always get is how like proud everybody is for everybody else and how talented they are and for what they made and for the fact that we live in a world where art can be celebrated and winning is just an extra fun part that also kind of determines whether your show will stay open or not. But I think that energy of camaraderie and love and pride and peacefulness is what the Olympics claims it is meant to be and means to represent. And I always understood that the Olympics was to be about connection and globality and sportsmanship, but then these policies are so focused on politics and who is allowed to succeed, disproportionately hurting the global south while being written primarily by Europeans. And maybe both of these things are actually remarkably similar from the inside, <laughs> where it's pretty on the surface and cutthroat underneath. And the Olympics have always been about politics, no matter how much they try to pretend they're apolitical, but I'm just... I'm looking at this and I'm trying to understand as a non-sports person why all of this matters so much. Because at the end of the day, it is sport. It is play. It is one of the most basic human drives and that doesn't make it any less important or valuable. It just puts it into perspective for me how nitpicky this conversation is around something that is so massive and so flawed but also so beautiful and so cool at the same time. And I'll be honest, at the beginning of researching this I didn't know a lot of these things and I sort of believed some of the lightly transphobic talking points to be true because I don't care about sports so why would I bother looking into them? All I knew was that trans people were being unfairly targeted and trans kids should be able to do whatever the hell they want and I didn't think further about that. But after learning all of this and seeing how truly wishy-washy all the science is and how hyper-specific some of these rulings have been against certain groups of marginalized people, I'm, I'm just racking my brain as to why this matters so much. I mean, obviously it matters because being transphobic is hot politics right now and that's why, but beyond that, um, it's just, it's so complicated and so messy and I think we're so hyper-focused on one thing when it is a much wider issue and there's a whole lot of other things to be paying attention to. But anyway, I'm gonna leave this one here. I hope that you learned something today. I definitely did. Um, tell me what weirdly obscure sport you're most looking forward to watching in the Olympics. I like watching archery, gymnastics, fencing, uh, synchronized diving is cool, um, surfing is fun, um, and I recently learned that there's a there are canoe related sports. So maybe I'll watch this this time. I want to see the canoe related sports. We'll see. I always get really excited about watching Olympics and then I realize how much sport there is all the time and I get very overwhelmed to give up very quickly. But anyway, finishing the video. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it is never too late to start over and critical thinking is super, super sexy. I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.